Hi everyone, welcome to the very first marketing masterclass. And we're starting with the big one. We're starting with how to make more money, how to enjoy your life. How, so the, the title is how to multiply your profits with one simple trick, okay? And let me tell you what this promises. This is my goal for today that this webinar will inspire you and give you simple small steps that you can action immediately which will transform your work and measurably increase your happiness. I would invite you to switch off any other communications for the duration of this. I'm going to try and do this. I've got about 60, 65 slides. I'm going to try and do this in an hour. Please switch off email. Definitely switch off Facebook, Twitter, anything like that. Give me your focus for one hour and it will be worth it. Okay? Let me inspire you. Let me show you things that you can do right away that will transform your life. Okay? That's my promise to you. So we're talking about how to multiply your profits. And that lets you do a bunch of different things. You can earn more if you want to earn more. You could double your worth or more than double your worth. We've got a whole section on that later. If you want to do less work, this could help you do less work. If you want to enjoy your work more, this will help you do that. And it's one simple trick that makes all this possible. I know it sounds cheesy. I know it sounds like marketing. And to some degree, it is marketing. But I hope you believe me. Here's the answer. The answer to enjoying work more, increasing your profits, all of it is this. Do more valuable work. Right? It's as simple as that. Sounds too simple, right? Do more valuable work. So we're going to address this in two sides. In the first part, we're going to be talking about work itself. And in the second part, we're going to talk about wealth and worth and how we see ourselves and how our minds and the way that we think can affect what we actually put out into the world. You can't address one without addressing the other. So let's start with work. Do more valuable work. Right? What does that mean? On one level, it means do work that is more valuable. Do work of a higher value than what we're doing now. On, a, on the other hand, it also means do more of that work. Because, believe me, all of us right now are doing a wide range of work and some of that work, as we'll see in a minute, is very valuable. Some of that work is less valuable or almost worthless. So in order to do that, in order to do more work that is of higher value, it also requires, because you know, we've all got 24 hours times seven days in a week, right? It requires that we give up being busy, making ourselves busy with less valuable and less rewarding work. And I do find that the most valuable work is also rewarding on every level. So we're talking about happiness as well as things like money and profit here. How many of you can empathize with this, this vicious cycle where your life is full of being busy doing work that is just good enough. Yeah? Every day you're doing things, you're doing them harder, you're putting more work in, you're putting more time in, you're snatching time away from your family, and you're doing all this work that just seems to keep you at the good enough level. It's, you're just paying your bills. There's a little bit of stress, but you get through. You get through every month. You make it through every year. If you're lucky, you'll get a vacation. Right? And what, what you find is that your time becomes full. Your week is packed out. You're full of tasks. Yeah? And there's no room to maneuver. You haven't got the space 
in which to step back and change things. You go away on vacation, you're absolutely knackered, right? You start to feel happy to know that you're going on vacation. Then a few days before you come back, you start feeling miserable again because you're coming back to the, the same life of just good enough, just making enough. Your time is full of doing things that seem to be important, seem to be necessary. But it seems like the more you do them, the, the more you're, you're stuck in that, in that process. If anyone remembers these little uh, puzzles that you used to get as a, as a child, where you have to rearrange all the, the little tiles that slide around in order to either make a picture or to put the numbers in the right order. It's, life can feel like that. And I've done it. And let me tell you, it doesn't really matter how much you're earning, right? If it's just good enough. I spent a few years earning, you know, five figures per month for, for several years. And it was just good enough because that money was being spent. And, you know, we were... <clears throat> We were on, uh, how, do I, how do I describe it? The, all the money was being spent and we were actually owing the government, my business, my former business that I ran with my ex-wife was owing the government because we'd spent all the money and we were on payment plans for the tax that should have been paid, right? So it doesn't matter whether you're earning a four figure or five figures, six figures, right? If it's just good enough, it's just good enough. On the other hand, there's a virtuous cycle. Imagine this. If you could do more high value work, you would generate more wealth. And I appreciate the word wealth may trigger some buttons for us. What that lets you then do is pay other people to do the work either that you don't want to do or that you don't have to do. And that gives you more time to do more high value work, to earn more wealth, to pay others to do the work that you don't want to do or don't have to do. You see how it works? That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about breaking the old cycle. So this isn't just academic. We're going to have some specific, real steps that you can take. We're going to try and cover all of those in the next few minutes. Why, why do we want to do this? Okay, we're going to get philosophical today. Why should we break the cycle of just good enough? Why should we set out, be determined to be wealthier, to have more richness in our life, to have richer lives, to generate more wealth, to pass on more, more wealth to other people? On one level, it's as simple as life is just too short. It's too short to worry about what other people think of us and to play a small game. We should just be playing the biggest game that we can play. And we'll come back to all of that in the second part when we're talking about wealth and worth. And I find that the longer you live, and I'm 40 now, don't the years start to tick by quicker? You know, when you're a child, the, the, the length of time between one summer holiday and Christmas and the next summer holiday seemed like a lifetime, because it nearly was. You know, when you're five, a year is a massive span of your life. When you're 40 or 50 or 60, a year becomes less, and time starts to tick by. And then you start to think, I wonder if I'm halfway. You know, you're waiting for the bell to ring for the final lap. And that's when we start to think, what was it all for? This lady is called Bronnie Ware. She's an Australian palliative nurse. And that means that she's spent years of her life working with people who are dying. And I think a couple of years ago, she brought out this book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And it made the news. 
because she spent time with people who are who know they are at the end of their lives and she's spoken to them and she's helped them and coached them through this process so let me tell you what the book says are the top five regrets of the dying here they are I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me I wish I hadn't worked so hard now just as we read through these ask yourself you know is, is this true for you now do you have a bit of this is this triggering something for you now I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends and I wish that I'd let myself be happier because guys really what we're talking about today isn't money right profits is good money is good and I think it's a really good idea for us all to start saying to ourselves I love money right I know the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil okay just don't do evil right there is nothing wrong intrinsically with money it doesn't say money is the root of all evil now so what we're really talking about is letting ourselves be happier giving ourselves the permission to have happier better richer more valuable more meaningful lives okay it's no small task that we're taking on in this first master class so you might be thinking in the back of your mind isn't it obvious yeah isn't it obvious that we should just do more valuable work of course if we do more valuable work we're going to get more money yeah it is it is obvious it's really simple and I started by saying that there was one simple trick okay to transforming your life and, and the quality of life that you have it is simple I didn't say it was easy if it was easy we'd all be doing it and I'm as guilty as, as the next person in falling into the traps that stop me from being as wealthy as I could be. We all know how to lose weight. We all know what it takes to be a healthy weight. Now, I don't know how many of us on the call would consider yourselves overweight. I do, right? I know what to do about it need to stop eating crap eat more healthy food good protein fresh veg yeah and do good exercise right I know what to do doesn't mean that I'm doing it day in day out it's obvious how to do how to be a healthy weight but it's not easy and this is the same so this is why what I'm going to try and do today is break it down for you we're going to try and put a process together that can let any of us know exactly what we can do now and I'm not talking about things that that you can start doing tomorrow I'm talking about things we can start doing today at the end of this call when I started putting together the pro web design course about three years ago now I came up with this thing I call the golden triangle and it's simply what it simply means is we should when we're positioning our business when we're thinking about what kind of web designer or what kind of whatever it is we want to be we should think about these three main factors do you love doing it that's the most important thing if you don't love doing something you ain't gonna do it well you're not gonna wake up at four o'clock in the morning and be passionate about it it's not gonna get you bouncing out of bed you're not going to love talking to other people and enrolling them in your vision, right? If you don't love doing it. So love is the most important thing. And we can all love what we do. Is it profitable? There's no point really doing a business that isn't going to generate profits. Okay. Now the profit could be money or it could be other value, right? But is it worthwhile work? That's very important. It's also an important key to happiness as well to be able to see the relationship the link between the effort that you exert and the value that is generated human beings need that in order to be happy if we set up business structures 
that break that link so that people just do one mechanistic task and don't see the point of it, then you feel unrewarded. It's actually an intrinsic part of what we need. And then finally, can you do it well? Because if you suck at it, you're not going to be successful either. So what we're looking for is stuff that's in that middle section. Yeah? Stuff that you love doing is profitable and you're good at. However, what I want to do today is crank that up. You know, let's kind of make it 3D. How much do you love it? How profitable is it? And how well do you do it? Because there could be stuff that, you know, is kind of profitable. You know, writing a blog post and then putting an AdSense ad on the side of it, all right, it's technically profitable. It's taking some of your time and it could earn you a few cents or a few dollars over a few months. You might be good at it. You might love writing this stuff, right? But if you, if you love it a bit, if you're quite good at it and it's only slightly profitable, that's not, that's not really what we're talking about, is it? What we're talking about is stuff that you love doing, that's really profitable, and that you can do really well as well. So if you've read the emails that I sent out about this webinar today, I'm talking about three books that have made a significant impact on my life. Two of those books I've written myself, and the third one was written by Perry Marshall. The first one is Save the Pixel. I wrote Save the Pixel in 2007. And here's why it's significant. Because I didn't quite know exactly what I was doing when I set out, but I knew that I loved it. I knew that this was something that I had a passion about, which was basically sharing with people what I had figured out about what makes web design work. Why does one thing work better than another thing? And quite honestly, that's what I'm doing today. You know, this is, this is my mission. This is what I do. It's what I do in my life. So I figure out what makes websites work and then share that knowledge with other people. I love doing it. In 2004, I started writing web design from scratch. That became popular. Thousands of people a day started coming along to these, to read these articles, which nobody else had had the insight or the inclination to write and publish. Then I wrote Save the Pixel in 2007. And Save the Pixel, I, I don't know how much it's generated in terms of sales, but I know that it's a six-figure number, right? I, I would say it's between $100,000 and $200,000. That's for a book that took me six months to write part-time. Okay, and um, so it's profitable, right? I love doing it, it's profitable, and I was good at it. I didn't know how profitable it would be at the time, right? But now I know that publishing, particularly ebooks, is can be particularly effective. Then, more recently, quite recently, I wrote How to Be Number One because we'd identified, we'd, as, as we're working through or lots of business challenges with the Pro Web Design Alliance, we started identifying areas where, wow, no, we really should start to specialize. It's important to specialize, yeah? So all this um, insights about niche marketing started to appear. And then I thought, well, let's put it together into a book, okay? And so how to be number one was an important milestone for me because that was me figuring out why it's important to do what you do really well. Why it's important to specialize, to focus, and to become great at something. Know what it is you're great at and be the person for that. And then finally, this was literally just a few weeks ago, I was contacted by Perry Marshall, who is a one of the most successful copywriters and, and marketers out there. And we were introduced by a mutual friend who said, Perry's trying to get in touch with you. Uh, when I communicated with Perry, he said, 
I've been advised that you might like to write a, a quote for my new book. Right? Now, I'd just been away camping for the weekend. I got this message when I was miles from home with Sally, with our dogs, sat in a field on my own um, with no one else around us. And this message comes through on my phone from Twitter. Right? When I got back to the office, I had, I think it was a long weekend, I had three days worth of emails to catch up on. And then Perry Marshall sent me this booming PDF file. But he said, I need it back by Wednesday. So I had less than 48 hours to review it. I started reading the book, which is 80-20 Sales and Marketing. It blew my mind. I barely blinked by the time I got halfway through the book. I read it in probably three hours flat. And the ne very next day, I'd written Perry the most amazing testimonial. And I think why this is important is that Perry's book helped me to put together some of the last few pieces of the puzzle. Now, this 80-20 principle has been around for hundreds of years and it's incredibly effective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that now and then how that applies to all these areas of our lives. Right. So very, very simply. Now this, this was put together by an Italian thinker called Pareto a long time ago where he noticed that 80% of the wealth was in the hands of 20% of the population. Now, 80-20, that same distribution, we now realize applies almost everywhere. Here's how I propose to apply it today. 80% of the output, 80% of the benefits, right, are generated by 20% of the input or 20% of your effort. 80% right? of the benefits come from 20% of your effort. That also means, the flip side of that is that just 20% of the value that you generate comes from the other 80% of the time that you spend, the effort that you do, the stuff that you do. Now, here's a, an image of the 80-20 curve. And I think if you go to 8020curve.com you can actually play with these. The Perry's very kindly put together a free tool that you can access that let's for, for example here what we've done is say we've, we've had 50 people for example who've paid one dollar right then what it does is that every, right, everyone is willing to pay one dollar for something or everyone was willing to donate one dollar okay what this says is based on this natural law this natural law that comes up again and again and again the 80-20 curve. How many people would be prepared to pay five dollars, right? If if 50 would prepare to pay pay one, and it's just using that 80-20 logarithmic distribution, right? We don't have to understand how it works, but if we look there, there's about seven people would be prepared to pay five dollars or more. Three of those people would be able to pay or invest $10 or more, two of them 15 and the top one about $25. And this pattern comes up again and again and again. For example, let's just take some, some random examples from the book. One thing was where if you look at people who donate to a political campaign or to a charity, you find this distribution. 80% of the donations come from the top 20% of the people. They also looked at volunteer organizations like a church where people volunteer to help out. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the volunteers. It also applies to businesses. You know, the top 20% of the most valuable businesses generate 80% of the, the turnover. It occurs again and again and again because it's natural law. It's just the way that stuff works. Now what's really important and the focus of what we're talking about today is how this 80-20 principle applies to your time. So I've got a screenshot here of this specific exact tool that Perry publishes at 8020curve.com what I've done is, 
I put in that there are 160 hours, okay, in a month. So say you do you do 40 hours of work a week. You're at work for 40 hours in in a month. Sorry, 40 hours in a week. That's 160 hours in a month. And let's say that the value of the work that you do is ten thousand dollars in a month. Okay. Plug that into this tool, and it gives you this distribution. It's saying that the majority of your time, let's say out of those 160, 110 of those, if you go up to the 50 mark, majority of your time is worth you generate you're doing less than fifty dollars worth of value. Right? So two thirds of your time is generating very little value, relatively little value, less certainly less than half of the area of that, that graph, right? The top 20% of your time, the most important, valuable 20% of the stuff that you do, generates 80% of the value. Okay? So that is probably around the kind of 30, 40 mark. Yeah? Though your, your most important... So what's the top 20% of 160 is, is 32, right? That's your top 32 hours. You look at that, generate 80% of the value. The most valuable hour is probably worth something like $1,261. So what we're saying is, and, and you can also see here that, that your most important three or four hours are worth at least $500. So what are you doing in those hours that are worth that kind of money? And this applies to all kinds of jobs, by the way. So this is very challenging for us. 80% of our time is not generating much value. 20% of our time is generating most of the value. If only we could know what that stuff is. And also, because this is a, a, a geometric curve, this is mathematical, the top 20% of the top 20% of your time is worth 80% of that top 80%. Now, put that simply, the top 4% of your time that you spend generate 64% of the value. Take it to another level, the top 1% of the things that you do generate 50% of the value. And this pattern is a pattern in nature. We see it over and over and over again. So this stuff can apply to any project that you take on. Right? The, the best 20% of the projects you take on will generate 80% of the value. Now I can tell you that's true. It's true for me. hope it's true for you. The top or best 20% of the clients that you take on will generate 80% of your profits. Also, the 20% of the worst clients that you have will give you 80% of your headaches, 80% of your complaints as well. It applies to tasks that we do daily. It applies, applies to tasks that we do every week or every month. This 80-20 stuff applies to pretty much everything. Everything that we do. So, what have we got to do? What's the challenge for us here? So, in brief, what we've got to be doing is more of that top 20% stuff. And we need to stop doing the bottom 80% stuff. Or do less of it, okay? Now, this is um, inspired by David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, where there's basically three choices. And the way I describe that is either do it, delegate it, or drop it. So let's look at those three things. And let's try and figure out, okay, when should we do it? When should we delegate it? And when should we drop it? So hold on to your hats, pay attention, because we're going to answer some very, very important questions now. We'll start with do it. How do you know which of the, of, of the things that you do are in the top 20% or even the top 20% of the top 20%? How do you know? Well, here's how you can know. Let's check out some questions. 
one very important one is could somebody else do it could they do it well enough doesn't have to be quite as well as you could somebody else do it anyone who has read uh, Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week you'll know all about this he's very big on delegating outsourcing could somebody somebody else do it also is it profitable will do you actually profit from this work if so how much is it a repetitive task is it something that you do again and again and again okay there's a principle in software engineering programming called dry it stands for don't repeat yourself it means don't write a line of code twice don't write the same bit of logic twice if you do it once save it as a subroutine or a function so that it can be run again and again and again you shouldn't have to duplicate anything and this applies to our time if you find yourself doing something doing the same thing more than once that's repetitive and that could be a sign that you don't necessarily have to be doing it maybe somebody else could do it maybe some software could do it and then of course is it vital is this vital to your life or your business if it's not vital is it important or is it just helpful or is it just a nice to have is it something you do out of pure vanity right posting clever things that you come up with on Twitter for example I'm holding my hand up to that one I try not to do it very much let's have another look at our golden triangle So we've got the three circles, things that you love, things that you do well, and things that are profitable. Obviously, the stuff that you love, do really well, and is really profitable, you should do it. Yeah, keep doing that, right? That's the stuff that we should do. But what about all the stuff that falls into the other areas? Okay? If it's not profitable, okay, then we're basically talking about hobby. Right? In fact, if you don't love it and it's not profitable, but you're good at it, then it's probably not something you should be doing anyway. Just don't bother with that one. If it's not profitable, but generally it's a hobby. If you want to do it and you're good at it, even if you're not good at it, do it if you want to, but do it outside of your work time. That's your hobby. Don't make it your business. Okay? If it's not going to, if it's not worthwhile, if you're not going to generate value, make the world a better place and make your life richer. Don't do it. Don't make it your business. If it's profitable and you love doing it, but you're not good at it, we're talking about that top right one. Okay? You either need to train yourself to be better at it, or you need to delegate it to somebody else. If it's profitable and you don't love doing it, whether or not you do it well or not, if you don't like it, try and delegate it. Okay, so it's pretty much as simple as that. If it's profitable and you love doing it and you can do it well, do it. Otherwise, delegate it to somebody else or if it's not profitable at all, don't do it. Certainly don't do it for your business. So here is one specific thing, actual task, that you can start doing. I would recommend you start doing this on Monday, right? We call it the time chunking exercise. Now I'm going to send you a sheet of paper that you can print out that will help you to do this exercise. And here's what you do. Sounds tedious, I know, but it can be very, very enlightening. You record everything that you do in your working hours for one week down to 15 minute intervals. Then after that, you go through all of those tasks down to the 15 minutes so that's what eight hours a day 15 minutes that's 32 chunks of every day and ask yourself these key questions did it have to be done right did I have to do it was it repetitive is it something that I can do well could somebody else have done it do I enjoy it and is it profitable? So those are seven key questions that you can apply to every 15 minute chunk of one week. 
And what that will help you to identify is stuff that you shouldn't be doing, stuff that you could delegate to somebody else. Okay? This isn't very, very simple and very, very challenging exercise. So, we're talking about doing it. Now, 80-20 doesn't always mean doing less stuff. Right? Um, when you break the habit of doing stuff that you don't have to do, one of the things that can happen is it can give you a lot more time to do something else. And when you've got a lot more time, you could find yourself doing something massive. I wrote Save the Pixel. Okay? That was massive action, even though it was in my spare time, I was still running my agency. Wrote that in six months. I created the Pro Web Design course, set up the Pro Web Design Alliance, also in six months. These two things are the most valuable, profitable, six figure generating exercises that I have ever done. So sometimes massive action is the key. Sometimes massive action is completely right and completely appropriate. What we very often find though is that we are too busy doing crap we don't need to be doing in order to be able to take massive action. So here's the thing. There's two important things that we've got to do. One is strategy and one is execution. Figure out what we need to do and then do it. Now both of these things can be in your top 20%, strategy particularly, right? But also doing the right thing. Strategy on its own isn't going to get you anywhere. If you spend your whole week doing strategy and don't execute anything, you're going to go nowhere fast. If you spend your whole week being busy with execution without the strategy of working out what it is that you should have done, you're just going to be wasting your time running around chasing your tail. So you shouldn't get stuck in strategy and you also shouldn't get stuck in execution either. Either one can become a habit. And we need to be very careful and watch out for habits. What are the things that we do repetitively without thinking about it? Sometimes in your top 20% work can be some, when it's time to act, and you know it's time to act, and you know it's the right thing, act. Act decisively. Just do it. And do it with all the energy and commitment that is appropriate for the task. If your task was to break through a brick wall, okay, and you know that if you run at that wall 100% with 100% commitment, 100% effort, you'll break through, don't try 50%. Don't do it with 50% or 70 or 80 or 90%. Because all you're going to do is hurt yourself. When it's the right thing to do, do it and do it with your complete commitment. And I'm going to share with you a, quite a few quotes in the, the rest of this webinar. One of these comes from an old Japanese text called Hagakure. The heart, it means the heart of the warrior, as written by Yamamoto Tsunemoto. And this is about the, it's basically a training manual or a guide, a self-help book for samurai. And here's what he says about acting decisively. He says, in the words of the ancients, one should make his decision within the space of seven breaths. It is a matter of being determined and having the spirit to break through to the other side. What that means is don't labour overthinking stuff. Be very, very clear. Be extremely disciplined with your own mind, with your own thinking. And when you realise, when you identify something that needs to be done, then it's just a case of being determined and having the spirit to break through that wall. You just do it. Here's another quote from the same book. When one has made a decision to kill a person, even if it will be very difficult to succeed by advancing straight ahead, it will not do to think about doing it in a long roundabout way. The way of the samurai is one of immediacy, and it is best to dash in headlong. 
Now, we're not talking about killing people, right? I wouldn't approve of that. But when you have decided that something is right, just do it. Go straight for it. Don't wait for other people to give you the permission to do it. Don't wait for all the planets to line up and for all the conditions to be to be right. If something's right, you know it's right, you're in charge, do it. The way that I sum up both of those quotes is a much, much shorter way is to say JFDI. It stands for just fucking do it. And it's the right thing to do, just fucking do it. You've also got to remember to sharpen your axe, right? There's a uh, popular story that two lumberjacks were competing in a woodcutting contest. Who could cut down the most trees in an hour? And one of the lumberjacks was hard at work, chopping, 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 chopping. The other one did five minutes of chopping, then disappeared, and then came back later and chopped a few more trees. Then he went away again and came back again. And the, the first lumberjack was thinking, I've got this guy licked. You know, he, he's doing five minutes work and then he's disappearing for five minutes. He's not going to win. In the end, the guy who wasn't constantly chopping won by a big margin. The other guy went up to him and said, look, what were you doing? You know, you, you, you did five minutes work and then you disappeared. And yet you still beat me. How did you do it? And the guy said, I was sharpening my axe. All of us need to sharpen our axe and you need to make time to sharpen your axe. What you guys are doing today is sharpening your axe. Yeah, it's sharpening the edge that you've got. The thinking is whenever you put time aside to read an important book, right, to do a course, to go on a webinar, something that you know is important for you, that's sharpening your axe. So that is definitely in the top 20% of stuff to do. Working with a coach could be the same thing as well. Take the time aside. Sometimes just stop. Make sure that you are performing to your highest possible level. When I'm at work, when I'm at my desk, now I work, I generally start work around about 11 a.m. and I usually finish between three and five. Sometimes I'll work later. Okay. Now, I do find, important note, a lot of tasks will expand the, to fill the time that you give them. Tasks can fill the time that you give them. I gave myself three days to put this presentation together. I had a really good idea what it was about, but I only decided on Monday that this was going to be the title. And um, I wrote most of the content in bed in the morning on my phone. And yet today, I needed to sleep. I hadn't had enough sleep. So I stayed in bed until 10.50. Right? I let myself catch up on some sleep because I needed to be sharp. I made it into work about 11.30 and I put this presentation together in about three and a half hours. Right? If I'd have given myself, normally I give myself two days to put a presentation together. If I give myself two days, I take two days. Today I gave myself three and a half hours. I took three and a half hours. So when, what I was saying is when I'm at work, for however many hours it is in the day, I have a reminder that pops up on my screen every 30 minutes, sorry, every 60 minutes. And it says, take a break, boss. All right, have a stretch. So what I will do is I will step away from my desk, which is a standing up desk, better for my energy. And I'll either do some stretching, I'll do 30 push-ups, I'll do some crunches. Something that I know is going to get my energy, get my blood flowing, get my energy flowing. And that keeps me more alert during the day. It only takes a minute every hour, but it's worth it. You've got to sharpen your axe. Right? There is no excuse for sitting at your desk for 12 hours cranking something out if you're working slow. That's just silly. Right? And if, if you find that you are somebody who is turning up for work for 10, 12 hours of a day, you are almost certainly spending the vast majority of that time in that bottom 80% that is unproductive time. Also on the subject of doing it, 
is another extraordinarily influential book is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. One of the things that he covers in that book is these four quadrants of stuff that you can do. And they are arranged into a two by two matrix, not important and important, urgent, not urgent. Now we can work through this, but the important thing is, what really matters is, he says we don't spend enough time in quadrant number four, which is, sorry, it's not, it's the uh, important but not urgent, it's actually quadrant number two in this diagram, okay? It's important but not urgent. We spend too much time in not important and urgent, right? Obviously important and urgent things. When there's a fire, you have to put it out, okay? But we spend too much time doing things, excuse me, need to get rid of Skype. Okay, apologies for that. Okay, we spend too much time, let's back up. We spend too much time in the urgent but not important, right? Stuff that just comes up, that interrupts us. A really, really good example of this is email. We spend time in our email. Uh, whenever a new email message comes in, we stop doing what we're doing and we address the email. Right, one of the things that Tim Ferriss says is assign a slice of your week, not even a slice of your day, a slice of your week for going through your email. And then you go through that email with a samurai sword. You don't do anything else. It's email one, deal with it. Yeah, Using that same David Allen, it's you know, do I need to action this? Can I delegate it to somebody else or do I just throw it in the bin? Okay. We need to spend more time doing the stuff that's important but not pressing, not urgent. And that's one of the things that freeing up your time from that bottom left quadrant can do for you. So what are the things that are in there? We've talked about strategy. We've talked about training yourself. Yeah, planning. If you're not going to do it, if you don't have to do it, second option is to delegate. Now, it's very important to know yourself. Know thyself is a, an ancient piece of advice. If you know your strengths and weaknesses, that is actually a great strength. You're better off knowing that you don't know something, right? Or knowing that you're not good at something or knowing that you don't love doing something, or knowing that it's not profitable. Okay, Once you know those things, you can make informed decisions, and making informed decisions is right up there. I very much recommend that you go and do the marketing DNA test. Again, this is something that Perry Marshall put together, and it helps you identify your particular likes and dislikes and strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the way that you market and way that you sell but I find also, and several of us in the Pro Web Design Alliance have been have, have, have done this, it's a completely free questionnaire. And it takes about maybe 10 minutes to complete. Uh, we find that it applies to more areas than just sales and marketing. It applies to business, it applies to the time management as well. When you know what your strengths are, you can then look for other people who have complementary strengths and abilities. That then lets you build a team of people who complement you. And here's the thing, right? Some people actually love doing the stuff that you don't. There's stuff that is outside of the I love doing it circle, right? And then like we're saying, if you don't love doing it, it's not gonna you're not gonna do it particularly well. There are other people who love doing the stuff that you don't like, right? I don't particularly like gardening, I don't particularly like DIY, I don't know how to fix a car. I know how to fix a bicycle, but not a car. So I love to pay somebody else who's good at that stuff and who enjoys doing it. 
who's chosen to do it for their job. That is the right thing to do. I've got great admiration for people who can fix their own car, but I'm not one of those people. What jobs don't you love doing that somebody else could do just as well or better than you? And probably cheaper as well. When you take into account the opportunity cost of your time, when you realize that a, one of your most productive hours could be worth thousands, right, that is the opportunity cost of doing stuff that you don't need to be doing. And this is all, 8020 is all about opportunity cost. Greek thinker Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Right, talking about leverage. We're talking about you've got certain skills, certain l passions, certain abilities that if you maximized them and optimized them could change the world, right? Could have a massive impact but if you rob yourself of the time and the energy with which to do the best stuff that you can do you're not going to have that big an impact so use other people who want to do the stuff that you don't want to do use other people who are good at the stuff that you aren't good at it's all about leverage Find the resources and make the most of every resource. That includes you and it includes everybody else as well. So let's look at some reasons why we don't outsource. Now let, tell me if any of these make sense to you. Right? Have you used these excuses at any point? I don't have the time to outsource. Right, that's that's absurd, but it's a very common excuse. I haven't got the time to, to recruit somebody to do this, to find a virtual PA, or whatever, right? In, incidentally, Perry Marshall says that every white collar worker should have a virtual assistant because the world is full of people who are online, who have time, okay? Could be somebody who is unable to leave the house, right? Or who has a few hours a day, who is perfectly capable of doing the stuff that you need doing, right? whether they're in your own country or overseas. Okay? And there are also organizations that will just assign to you a virtual PA. Perry says, whatever job you're in, if it's a white collar job, you should have a virtual PA to do some of the crap that you don't want to do. Okay? So don't say I don't have the time because you can do it quickly. I need the money in now. Right? I cannot take my nose off the grindstone for long enough because if I do that, the money will stop, will stop coming in. Right? How many of us are familiar with that particular excuse? How about I can't afford it? I can't afford to pay somebody else to do this stuff. Right? That is one of the most absurd of the possible excuses. The, the truth is you can't afford not to do it if you want to break the cycle. No one else can do it as well as I can do it. Right? That's a big one for me. But this, let me tell you, in the last two weeks, I have delegated three or four important jobs. Right? I've delegated business development right? to somebody who I'm hoping can do it as well as I can do it, if not better. I've delegated the writing of my next book right, to a co-writer. I've delegated the management and development of my affiliate program to somebody else. And there's a fourth thing as well. Oh yeah, the, the video production. Typically, when I would finish a webinar like this, I would then spend about three hours going through the video, editing out all the bits that don't need to be in there and the pauses, and then re-rendering it, okay? And I did a just good enough job of that. I have now delegated that job to somebody else. It's saving me three hours a week. Three hours a week. That could be thousands of dollars per week 
if I use that time properly? How about it will take me longer to explain than just to do it myself, right? If that's the case, you're talking to the wrong person. Right? This is a situation I have been in when I found myself holding off from delegating work to somebody because it was just quicker to keep doing it myself, right? And to try and, you know, drag them by the nose through the process of, of learning it. If you've if you're finding that is the case, then get somebody else to do it. Right, find somebody who is more capable, more willing. How about, it's too important, I don't trust anyone else to do it. It's another big one for me. And uh, you just got to get over that. you just got to get over it. Yes, yeah, stuff could be important, but if you're not good at it, or you don't enjoy doing it, then for goodness sake, don't keep doing it. Don't keep doing it every day, every week, every month. Find somebody, it takes a lot less time and a lot less cost to find somebody who can do it, who wants to do it, right? And will do a good job of it. Now, I think that all of those excuses are probably familiar. They all have some validity. You know, we understand why. But the bottom line is probably the real reason why we don't delegate is because we're just in a habit. We're in a habit of doing stuff ourselves, particularly if you're self-employed, if you're an entrepreneur, right, then you will find that you are in the habit of doing it yourself. And what you've got to do, very, very simple, you've got to stop it. Stop it. Now, I haven't got time to show you this video right now, but this is going to be one of the tasks at the end. I want you to look for this video on YouTube, whether you've seen it before or not. It's called Stop It. It's hilarious. And uh, it, it really just cuts through to the way that we can come up with so many excuses why we, why, you know, we do something habitually. And sometimes it's just a case of stop it. Just, just stop it. <laughs> okay, which brings us on to number three. If, you, if it needs to be done, you've got to do it, do it. Do it with everything that you've got. You know, do it properly, do it fast, do it with energy. If you can delegate it and it needs to be done, delegate it. Otherwise, we come to option number three, drop it. If it doesn't have to be done, don't fucking do it. Okay, DFDI. Doesn't have to be done, don't fucking do it. Here's a quote from our samurai friend. In the judgment of the elders, a samurai's obstinacy should be excessive. A thing done with moderation may later be judged to be insufficient. I have heard that when one thinks he has gone too far, he will not have erred. This sort of rule should not be forgotten. Right? The writer there is saying it's extremely important be obstinate, right? Be determined. Don't look for the approval of anybody else if something needs doing. And if something needs dropping, even more important. Sometimes, I mean, I, I get emails every day saying, please, sir, tell me basic codes or something like that. We're little one-line emails. I used to reply to those emails saying, um, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I had a kind of stock reply, but we, I would type it every time, okay, repetitive task, doesn't need doing, okay, I would say to people, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my time is all spent supporting my Pro Web Design Alliance members, and so I'm not able to give free advice, but, you know, I refer you to my course, or refer you to Web Design from Scratch, right, I've just given up doing that, okay, it's obstinate, I know, and I don't care, because my time's worth more than that. My time is worth more than writing five lines back to somebody who could only be bothered to write me one. Okay, so what? here's some ideas, just planting seeds, for things that we should give up. Right? Any habit that doesn't move you forward, advance you, deliver value. Anything that you do habitually that doesn't have value, stop it, drop it. Anything repetitive that doesn't need 
to be done, just don't do it. Scrap it. Put it straight in the trash. Who's going to know, right? What's the worst that could happen? You get another email off the person saying you didn't reply to my pointless email. So, you know, it's not that bad. Be obstinate. Because nobody else is going to come up and give you the permission to take charge of your own life. Right? There's only one person that can do that. Reading crap on social media cannot overstate how much time it's possible to take up. Talking crap on social media. Okay, if it's repetitive, if it's, there's no real value in it, if it's just addictive, jeez, my kids, right, have almost no self-control when it comes to stuff like Facebook. Okay, um, won't go into that, but you know, sometimes if if you don't know yourself, and I think when you're 12, 13, 14, you're just trying to work out who you are, right, and what other people think of you seems to matter an awful lot, right? Kids are getting sucked into Facebook and they seem completely unable to put it down, which is why we just, we took Facebook off our, off our 13 year old girls. Now, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you stand for, you don't know your place in the world, it's very easy to get sucked into this absolute universe, this maelstrom of content, comment, constant stuff, chat going backwards and forwards on social media, right? But you've got to be really, really strict with yourself and say, do I need to be reading this crap or do I need to be talking it or, or sharing it or reposting it? Writing crap content, I would suggest is in your bottom 80%. There's a big difference between writing something really good and writing something not really good, okay? Writing crap content that no one's going to like and no one's going to link to, it's probably not worth your while. Okay, Delegate it to somebody who can write and who wants to write. Pay them to do it. This is another one for me, particularly for analytics and uh, optimization tests. Looking at stats that are not actionable. If you repetitively go and look at statistics every day and don't do anything about it, right? So there's no actionable intelligence in there. You're just browsing st statistical porn. Don't just give it up. Not working is a good one. Not working is like the LinkedIn equivalent of Facebook, right? That means that you just spend time building relationships that aren't valuable relationships, okay? Networking is a completely different thing. But don't waste time building relationships with people who can't help you get to where you want to go. And then finally, this applies to any of us, particularly who make websites and design websites, doing custom work that doesn't need to be custom. That can apply to graphic design, right? If there's already an element that does this, if you can go and grab it from a graphics library, don't, and you, don't spend the time creating a new one. Do not reinvent the wheel. If there is a code library that will do the function that you need to do, don't spend time recoding it yourself just out of vanity. One of the most important lessons that any programmer, software developer will ever learn. If there is a theme that already has the layout and the mobile friendly everything that, that you need, don't create a brand new theme to do it. All right? So it applies to design and production and coding and probably everything else. Does this thing need to be done over again, custom, or is that prior art that I can reuse that will do it for me. If there's something that you can reuse or recycle to that will do what you need to do, use that, don't do it yourself. Because if you are, you're in your bottom 80%. Okay, that brings us to the end of part one. We've been going for an hour. Let's carry on, let's wrap up. All of that part one stuff, great, very, very important. Okay, we're talking all the, 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 the stuff about work, the tasks that we can do, what we spend our time on, all important. But without this, and we've been touching on this as we've gone on, the, the relationship that you and I have to wealth and to our self-worth 
is the subject of the second part of the webinar. So let's just go straight through it. Okay, first I want to debunk a myth. We have this structure in English where we use the phrase, he's worth 100 million, or she's worth 100 million, whatever it is, to describe a person's wealth. Now that's not exactly true. How much money you've got in the bank or the assets that you own, that's an external signal, but that isn't your wealth, right? Sorry, your worth. Yeah, Your worth is not that external signal of your wealth. Here's what it is. That guy or that woman who has assets worth 100 million, that person's worth is what they believe that they're worth. I'll say it again. Their worth isn't what they've got. Their worth is what they believe they're worth. Yeah, He's worth what he believes he's worth. She's worth what she believes he's worth. And that is how they got the wealth. Yeah, It doesn't go one way. You don't, you don't attract it and then you're worth it. You're worth it and then you attract it. That's how it works. So the way to double your worth is to double your worth. The worth comes first and the wealth comes second. I'm not going to get all deep into this law of attraction um, hocus pocus, right? This isn't, um, this isn't voodoo stuff. But the way to double your worth is to double your worth. It starts with you. And we can prove this. We attract what we ask for. Right, it's as simple as if you put you know, set out your shingle to say if you're a web designer, web design ten dollars an hour. Okay? What are you gonna get? You're gonna get clients who want web design and want to pay ten dollars an hour. That we attract what we ask for. And this works on every level in life. Not just what your hourly rate is, but it works on every level. Now we ask for what we believe we deserve. Is that true or false? It's right. If you put out into the world, you know, I don't take on a project for less than, I don't work for companies who are not, right? All of these things starts in your own mind. It starts with your word, right? Word is creative energy. In the beginning was the word, right? The word was with God and the word was God. The creative energy that created the universe is word in, in the Judeo-Christian mythology, right? Word comes first. What you say you're worth, then you believe you're worth. And then that then guides what you put out into the world and then that is your request and that's what you get so we attract what we ask for we ask for what we believe we deserve so what do you deserve what do you deserve and why do you feel you deserve it now that could be the topic for another year's worth of exploration right we haven't got the time to go into all of that now but we need to know thyself to start with yeah say so what do what do i deserve now what do i deserve per month what is a day of my time worth what is an hour of my time worth why do i think that let's challenge ourselves so why right if you if you can generate two thousand dollars in a month okay and you look at the 80 20 curve then you will realize that some of your time is worth four or five hundred dollars per hour okay hundreds of dollars per hour if you at your best if you at your most efficient at your sharpest is worth if you are worth hundreds of dollars per hour why are we charging less than that and we're going to talk about pricing in a minute here's a this is a fallacy this is a logical fallacy I've never done work for more than X amount. Therefore, I'm worth X amount. To say that, you know, this, this size of project or this hourly rate is the most I've ever been paid, 
to say that that is equivalent to your worth is bullshit because have you tried something else? No, the cause is you put out your request to the world. You put out your shingle to say, this is what I'm worth. It starts with your thinking, right? You caused that. That isn't the truth. That's the, the truth that you're telling the world. It's not the world telling you. Yeah, you create the effect. So let's be at cause. So here's an exercise. I am worth how much? What are you worth? What am I worth? I don't know. And this question scares the bejesus out of me, quite honestly. What am I actually worth? At my best, what am I worth? This is going to be one of the exercises. Now, here's a story. A few years ago, I was, as, as I told you at the beginning, I was working long hours. And I, I'm, you know, I'm talking 60 hours a week, right? I was the lead consultant for an agency. I was designing websites. I was running a small team. I was writing, creating software products which weren't worth anything, or I was creating ebooks which were. I was writing articles. I was very, very busy. And I was extraordinarily unhappy. I was in a very un unhappy marriage. At the end of a holiday in so August 2008, the marriage ended, thankfully, um, quite suddenly. It had been coming for a lot of years. I found myself in France with my wallet on my own and I needed to get home. I, I, I made it home in about 24 hours. Two days later, three days later, after I'd been staying at a friend's house, I found myself a house to rent and I needed to generate money. I sold my watch to pay for my the deposit on my home and uh, on the house and the first month's rent, okay? Um, I needed to generate money and I needed to generate it fast. By the end of that weekend, I think that's, you know, that was like a Friday, by the end of that weekend, I had created a sales letter and I'd sent that out to my mailing list, inviting people to take part in a course. This is the, the birth of the Pro Web Design course, right? one of the most valuable things I've ever done. And I said that membership of this foundation group of that course was worth $2,000. And there are some people on this, on this call today who accepted that offer. All right? Now, I had nothing. I had no content. I didn't really even have a syllabus or a plan for what I was going to teach. But there was something in me that knew that I could train people in, in knowledge and material that was worth way more than $2,000. Okay, so I put that out there. I put a limit on the number of places and I filled those places. I generated over $20,000 worth of payments from nothing, okay? Using nothing more than the power of my word. I put it out there. Yes, people had reason to believe me, right? But I put it out there said, I will teach you this and it's worth $2,000. And people said, yes. Here's an example of the power of the word. This is Dr. Samuel Johnson. It says, depend on it, sir. When a man knows he is to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. Right? Setting up, starting the Pro Web Design course was one of the most important and profitable things that I've ever done. And I did it because my back was against the wall. I had nothing else to do. I had to generate that money. There's a story of a businessman who approached a very successful and very wealthy mentor and said to him, I want you to teach me how to be rich. I, I, want, to, I want to know how to make way more than I, wake, than, than I make now. The guy said, okay, well meet me at the beach at 7 a.m. tomorrow. So at 7 a.m. the following morning, the rich mentor was down at the beach in his shorts and the businessman turned up in a suit. The guy said, come with me. He took him out into the sea. He starts wading into the sea. He says, follow me. The guy's thinking, what's going on? What is this? They kept going until it was above his knees, above his waistband. Kept going until the water was up to his chest. And the 
rich mentor turned to him and grabbed him by the shoulders and pushed him under the waves. And he held him in the sea until the guy was struggling for breath. Right? And, you know, he knew that he, if, if the guy didn't come back up very soon, then there's a chance of drowning. So he pulls him up and he says to him, that's what it's like. If you don't want it, if you don't want wealth as badly as you wanted that breath, then you're not going to get it. Okay? When you know you're going to be hanged in a fortnight, it con concentrates your mind wonderfully. I needed that money. Right? I had to, had to get it. I had to create it. So I created it. And this is the problem of being just, doing just well enough, earning just enough. I'm paying my bills every month. It can lead you to think, I don't, you know, I don't really want it badly enough. So you settle for second best. So we've got a simple choice in front of us. Keep doing what you've always done and you'll get what you've always got. Keep doing what you've always done and you'll get what you've always got or change it. It's as simple as that. Here's a little test as well. Um, if I definitely recommend you get a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. He identified seven qualities of the highest performing companies. He analyzed them all, um, hundreds of companies, and he identified seven qualities of companies that outperformed the market by a significant margin over a sustained period of time. And he came up with these seven things. And one of those things was the flywheel. And the flywheel means, this: the flywheel represents your business. You apply effort right in the right place. This is top 20% effort. And you, you push. Eventually, the flywheel just starts to move very slowly. But you keep applying effort. You keep pushing. Eventually, the thing starts spinning on its own, with its, almost with its own energy, and it's unstoppable. So it's about doing the right thing and keep doing it. So when we're asking ourselves, should I be doing this or should I not be doing this, here's a really, really useful answer. Does it move the flywheel? Right? Is it part of the core uh, strategy of what I'm about, what I want to do. So let's talk about pricing now. Pricing. Don't assume that because you've only ever caught one type of fish using that same old bait, that it's the only type of fish in the ocean. Your pricing is a big message, big part of the message that you give to the world. And I know that this is this is a hot topic. This is one of the things that we're constantly talking about on the Pro Web Design Alliance forums. And there's even conversations, two conversations about it today that have started today about pricing. How do we price? Your pricing is your bait. Your pricing is the shingle that you put out. Your pricing affects what you attract. And if you use one type of price and you attract one type of client, Okay, it's the same. It's it's the same fallacy. That doesn't mean that that's the only type of client out there. Your pricing filters the market for you. Now, here's the great thing about pricing. This is part of our core philosophy. The more people pay, the better they expect you to be. And that is a good thing for many reasons. The more a client pays, the more expert they expect you to be. The more capable they expect you to be, the better the results they expect, and they will leave you to get on with your job. They will think, if you price yourself like an expert, if you price yourself like the expert, then people will believe that you're the expert. I wrote an article on Web Design from Scratch called, What Kind of Whore Are You? Okay, If you're in the service, um, any kind of service industry, so I was thinking about the oldest you know world's oldest profession prostitution comparing the idea of a really high priced um, escort uh, you know a thousands of dollars an hour escort who is glamorous and beautiful and you know important thing very much in control they are in control of their of their job what they do what they don't do compare that to a cheap street crack whore right a twenty dollar prostitute Right? They don't, don't call the shots. 
Right, so what do you want to be? If you're in the service industry, if you work for clients, in, and in fact, you know, I have to say that this applies as well if you are employed, what you say you are worth significantly affects the perception that people have of you and the way that they treat you and what they expect from you. And it's good for people to expect good things from you. You could have 10 cheap, crappy clients per month or one really good one, okay, paying the same amount of the, as, as those 10 were paying. The good client expects you to do your best work, right? Now, if you're not doing, if you're not manically doing, throwing out work as quickly as you can for the 10 cheap clients, you've got one client who's paying top dollar, you've got time to do your best work. You've got time to discover what your best work is that you may never have discovered because you're too busy with your nose to the grindstone. More people pay this, better they expect you to be and that's a good thing. There's always room at the top. This is a, a big quote for me at the moment. There's always room at the top of a market, right? Now the bottom of the market, the cheapest end of the market is dictated by how cheaply pe people can provide and source products and services, okay? There is a bottom limit, okay? It's just above zero. And this applies to, to most things. There's always a cheap end of the market. The cheap end of the market is also usually highly competitive and highly busy and it's dominated by the people who've got the biggest uh, turnovers and, and um, scale who can provide stuff faster and cheaper. Right? It's a really 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 bad idea to try and compete at the bottom of a market. It's a really really good idea to compete at the top of a market and that's one really good reason why we should specialize and niche and be the person in something. Now, check this out. The graph you see there is the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average over a period of six years. Okay. What you see is a massive dip and then gradual recovery to about the mid-2006, uh, mid-2007 mark. Okay. Underneath there we have figures uh, that give you the sales of the Bugatti Veyron supercar, right? This is a million dollar automobile. Okay, in 2007 they sold, it, it, it came out in 2005. In 2007 they sold 81, right? In 2008, when the market halved, they sold 71 million dollar automobiles, okay? The market halved in that year. They went from 81 to 71. Then three years later, the market recovered. They sold 38. Now, what is this telling us? Okay, I would suggest it's telling us absolutely nothing. What it's not telling us is that when times are hard, rich people become less rich. It is said that there are more millionaires created during the Great uh, Depression than any other time in US history, in, in, including the most recent years. More millionaires were created during the Great Depression than any other time. There were always rich companies. There were always rich clients. There were always rich people who are willing to pay top dollar for the best stuff, and that stuff doesn't change. People are still buying million dollar supercars even when the market is at its lowest point for decades. So don't worry. There's always, always room at the top of the market. There's always room for the Fabergé eggs, for the Rolex watches, for the handmade shoes. Don't worry about it. And there's room for you up there. You can also think about going whale hunting. This book uh, is really about about sales and it, what it says is don't waste time at the low end trying to convert a lot of smaller clients instead go for the big dream opportunities and it compares it to an Eskimo or Inuit um, person who may spend a lot of their time with a fishing rod down a hole in the ice trying to catch fish right they catch a fish that's worth half a meal for half a person they have to keep catching loads of fish then they go home, they have a meal, everybody eats. Then the next day they have to go out fishing again. So you spend a lot of time 
trying to catch these little fish. Alternatively, what they, what they do is they get a team of people in canoes, they identify, they scout for where the whales are, they go out and harpoon the whales, they bring the whale back, and everybody eats for months from one kill. Right? The point is, it's a lot less work to retrieve one whale than it is for everybody to be sitting there fishing through the ice. Right? So, again, we, we can think at, at the top of market. We are probably constraining ourselves and constraining our own thinking based on what we're worth, what we think we can achieve. And all we're doing, if we do that, is leaving room for other people who think bigger. <clears throat> Let's think about how 80-20 applies to client work, working for clients. We've already said that the best 20% of your clients, best 20% of the projects, will probably generate 80% of your profits and probably 80% of your best case studies as well. Cannot overstate this. If you work for clients, choosing exactly who your ideal client is is worth the world. Right? It's almost like we should have a carved figurine of our perfect client on our desk constantly so that when you go out into the world, you know exactly who you're talking to and exactly who you're going to say no to, who you don't even enter into a conversation with. Right? When you write a letter or an email or an ad, or a guest blog post, right? You're doing that from the point of view of you know who you are, you know what you're worth, you know who your clients are, you know what your you, your prices are, right? You know what you deliver. That self knowledge, knowing who that ideal client is, what their profile is, what their fingerprint is, is worth an awful lot. The flip side of that, which is probably more important, is knowing exactly all the things that you don't want in your business right don't be afraid to qualify people out if and, and put up tests for them you know uh, one of the things that we're talking about is um, a 999 dollar application fee for even applying to become a client of the uh, new agency right anyone who isn't going to pay 999 dollars is not going to pay the kind of fees that we want to earn in our agency. So put up tests. Be busier qualifying people out than qualifying them in. So here's a fascinating exercise about where, where and how we should price. Okay, Should we price what we do at the point where everybody says yes or Maybe 50% of people say yes. I was at a conference once talking about pricing and a woman turned to me and said, if half your prospects aren't saying no to you based on price, you're not charging enough. I thought, that's interesting. And then promptly carried on undercharging. Or should it be less than 50%? Well, let's have a look. Let's figure it out. The, the point at which everybody says yes is kind of the McDonald's end of the market. Okay. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being McDonald's or any other type of business. There's room for lots of businesses at lots of points in the market. However, if you're in a service business, then there's a, a distinct difference between you and McDonald's, right? McDonald's is a volume business. They can fulfill thousands of orders per hour and they're all over the place, right? McDonald's is the price point at which pretty much everybody can say yes. Yeah, I want a meal that's hot in my tummy in a few minutes and it's just going to cost me a few dollars or a few pounds or whatever. Okay? Starbucks is kind of more in the middle. Starbucks is premium coffee. It's more expensive than other ones. In fact, they, they pretty much invented the premium coffee sector. Now, not everybody can afford Starbucks. You know, it's not that much better and that much worth it for people to want to spend three or four or five dollars on a cup of coffee. So not everybody wants to do it, but enough people do it for it to be very profitable as well. But it's not McDonald's. Then on the right hand side, that is actually a, a sandwich that was sold at the London store Selfridges that cost 85 pounds. That's about 
what, $130, $140. Okay, a sandwich for 85 pounds, but people will pay it. And you can make money at all these points in the market. Now, let's ask ourselves, for you, for your business, what should you charge? And I'm assuming right now that everybody here is in the service industry in, in, in some form or another. Okay. Now, what I've done here is I've used the graph at 8020curve.com. I've used the tools there to say we've got 100 clients. Okay. And I've said that all of them would be willing to pay $1,000. So, 100 clients, every one of them would, would be prepared to pay $1,000 for a particular service. Now, this might be an hour of your time, it might be a website, I don't, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. If everybody would pay 1000 right, and if you pushed it up to like, 1200 you'd lose 20% of the people. And if you pushed it up towards 2,000, you know, only 60% of people would still want it. And if you, you keep pushing up and the, the curve gets steeper, where's the optimal point? So the bottom one is really how many percent of people would say yes, okay? Just assuming that the 80-20 curve is natural law, which is true. If only one client said yes, you're looking at about the maybe 50, 60,000 mark. Let's say your top, let, let's use 80, 20, or look at the top 20, right? Top 20%, that is equivalent to about, I would say, about four and a half thousand dollars. Right? Four and a half thousand dollars times 20 clients that say yes. That gives you the $90,000, right? Now, here's the thing. You've got a hundred clients paying a thousand each, right? That gives you a hundred thousand dollars. That seems pretty good. Or you could just service the twenty best of those and get uh, ninety thousand dollars, only slightly less, right? But then you've got to take into account all the other costs that go into taking on a client, managing a client, servicing a client, right? And the work that you do for those top 20% isn't necessarily an awful lot more than you would have to do for the whole 100. Okay, you see, see how it works? So just talk to that 20% and then, you know, find another 20% like that. Because here's the other thing. If you do, do high-priced work for good clients who expect you to be good, which then forces you to do your best stuff then you'll get good case studies which will be seen by other good clients like those good clients who might play golf with those clients then you'll attract more clients like that it's all about your word it's all about what you put out into the market what you tell the world you are worth and then you become worth that that's the way around it works so when you know what you are worth when you know who your ideal client is and who your ideal client isn't that then helps you position yourself as the person for that niche. And that's really one of the key messages of how to be number one. Become the person. When you are the person, you don't need to be selling to 100 clients a year or a month or whatever it is. You may just need one or two or three. And that helps you do less work, but earn the same money, right? And remember the virtual cycle when you're doing less work for the same money, that gives you more time to delegate the stuff that you don't want to do, yeah, to identify what it is, to notice it, to be honest with it, delegate it, which gives you more time to do more good work and find even better clients. A virtuous cycle. Now you might ask, well, what if I'm employed? I'm not uh, an entrepreneur, I'm not a business owner myself. If you're employed, it's actually even more important because when you're employed, you've only got one client who's your employer. You've got one client if you're if you're in an employed position. That's your boss, the person who pays your, your, your paycheck. So it's even more critical to position yourself and to choose. And let's make no mistake, you still sell yourself if you're an employee. I was made redundant from an agency a few years ago, about 2002. I then went to find another job and, the, and the, after the interview, the guy sat me down and said, right, how much do you want? And I didn't know what to say. 
So I think I said 55,000 and the guy went out, did some calculations and came back and offered me 55,000 on target earnings. Now the guy might have paid 90, I just didn't know. Because I didn't know what I was worth. My previous job had been 33,000. So I just added some, see, see what happened. I didn't know my value. So here's the big thing guys. What are you waiting for? What's stopping you from doing more valuable work right now? Are you waiting for permission from somebody? Because that's never going to come. Right? The only person that can give you permission to be worth more than you are worth now is you. Are you waiting, waiting for the right conditions to come along? Are you waiting for something external to happen to show you it's the time for you to be worth more? Stop doing that. That ain't going to happen either. Are you waiting for a sign? Well, that's all I can give you. And you know, if you're waiting for a sign, there's a sign. And I would say it's, it's just time to let go of clinging to the addiction of the busy life. The busy life running around in circles doing repetitive things for little value. And here's another quote from Hagukare. The way of the samurai is found in death. Meditation on in inevitable death should be performed daily. Every day when one's body and mind are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, rifles, spears and swords, being carried away by surging waves, being thrown into the midst of a great fire, being struck by lightning, being shaken to death by a great earthquake, falling from thousand foot cliffs, dying of disease or committing seppuku at the death of one's master. And every day without fail, one should consider himself as dead. This is the substance of the way of the samurai. If anyone's read The Road to Santiago as well by Paolo Coelho, there's a similar exercise in there about meditating upon your own death. The importance of this is that it teaches you that life is short. It's too short to mess around and then suddenly, you know, you feel a cold bony hand on your shoulder and you go, oh, is that it? Do I get another go? Life's short. What are we waiting for? And what's the worst that could happen? I heard a story one time of a, a minister in the, in the US and he had an argument with his son and the son then went away and shot himself in the head and died, committed suicide. The minister's life was almost destroyed, right? He, it, it challenged everything, it challenged his, his faith, his self-belief. It shook him to the absolute core, and he came through it. And when he talks about this, he said, I've been to the bottom, and the bottom is solid. So we need to say to ourselves, what is the worst that could happen? You know, what's the, the, the worst that could happen is suddenly those bills that you've been scraping along being able to pay month in month out the credit card bills and everything suddenly you can't pay those for a couple of months because you're retooling because you're upping your game you're reinventing yourself you're going out to find the perfect work the perfect clients you can't pay those bills for a few months what's the worst that can happen are you going to lose the roof over your head are you going to lose your family no you know there are protections in our societies for those kinds of situations, right? Do not let, you know, how people describe fear is false expectations appearing real. F-E-A-R, false expectations appearing real. We think that when we get stressed because a bill comes in, that it's some kind of threat to our lives. And it's not. My, my mother died a few years ago and she left, I think, 45,000 pounds in credit card debts. I wrote to the credit card company saying she's died and they wrote the debts off. That was it. That happens. I know people who are who live in large houses, drive amazing cars and were bankrupt 3 years ago. Right? It really really doesn't matter that much. The worst that can happen ain't that bad. The bottom is solid.
Okay, so don't be paralyzed by fear. So let's just review. If we're going to meditate on the fact that life is short and transient, and the worst that can be the, the worst that can happen isn't that bad, let's just review the top five regrets of the dying. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That's what we're talking about today. Being true to yourself, right? Being worth what you are worth. Not just what you've been telling yourself you're worth for a long period of time. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That's exactly what we're talking about. right? I don't want to work that hard. I always said to myself I was going to semi-retire at 40. Because I love what I do. The best bits of it. I don't like the crap bits of it. But I wish I hadn't worked so hard. There are things that I've done in my life that took loads of work for no reward at all. And I wish I hadn't done those. I certainly don't want to repeat those mistakes. And I don't want you to. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. And I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Right? Having the courage to express your feelings. I don't know about you, but I mean, I was quite grumpy grouchy for several years because I was just working too damn hard I was doing 60 70 hours and I thought it was important and it wasn't important I actually missed the things that were important and when those things came up to me my family I was grouchy because I was so tired so driven right so I wasn't that, that that wasn't my true feelings that wasn't me being grouchy you know so when you are freer when you have more time, when you have time to rest, time to improve yourself, time to recoup your energy, then you will find that life, every area of life becomes easier. I've never been happier in my life than I am now. And I found my soulmate and the person that I believe I'm meant to be with. And that, that could only happen when I became free of the the repetitive, mundane, nose to the grindstone work. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. If you're not staying in touch with your friends because you're so bloody busy, we can fix that. And then finally, I wish that I had let myself be happier. And that is the realization that these dying people are telling you now across the years, let yourself be happier. The things that make us miserable are generally originating inside our own minds. We don't have to work so hard. We don't have to be so busy. We don't have to take on crap jobs for crap clients that we don't like to do. You don't have to work for an employer who doesn't treat you right. Let yourself be happier. Okay? So, I think it's true. I think that if we take full responsibility then we can change fundamentally and drastically the, the things that at the end of your life can make the biggest difference. How insane is that? And it comes down to little things. Do I love it? Am I good at it? Is there money in it? And looking at that 80-20, that final piece of the jigsaw, final piece of the puzzle. I'm going to leave you with this quote often attributed to Nelson Mandela, but it's written by Marianne Williamson, who says, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. And I think that, that sums it up very, very well. What are we waiting for? Your playing small doesn't serve the world. We should be. We have the responsibility to play the biggest game that we've played. Our parents gave us the gift of life. Our educators gave us the knowledge to be able to do bigger and better things than we're all doing today. I think we have the responsibility to play the biggest game we can play. So finally guys, 
Now, I know we've gone on for a lot longer than I, than I anticipated. Here are just six things that you can do right now. I promise that there were some specific actions that you could take away from this and apply right now, which will have a material difference to your profits, to your wealth, and to your level of happiness. Number one, go to YouTube, type in Stop It, and click on the first link. Watch that. It's a hilarious five-minute video. And then take the lesson. Sometimes it, we don't have to ask, you know, is it because my dad this or my mum that or my teacher did the other. Sometimes just, just stop it and use that in your life. If it's something that you don't need to be doing, if you have an addiction or a habit, stop it. How about stop fearing wealth? Say, I love money out loud. I love money. You know, how many of us kind of say we don't like wealth, we don't like rich people, we, we're grumpy about that, and yet um, on one level are secretly jealous because we, we want more, we do actually want more, but then what we actually do in our lives undermines and sabotages having more. Well, I think that is the Western condition. State what you are worth in black and white. I am worth something. Now what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to put together a one page cheat sheet with all the most important quotes and points from this presentation. I will, I will make sure you get a copy of that. And that will have a space for you to, to write on I am worth and then you fill in the rest. Commit to being a greater channel of wealth. Right? Your playing small does not serve the world. If you get to the point where you have a million dollars a month coming in, that is not a sin, that is not wrong. Because it means you can use that million dollars to pay lots of other people to do the stuff that you don't want to do. To mow your lawn, to clean your cars, to be your personal assistant, to develop your business, to go out and help make a bigger difference in the world that you are, that, than you can make now, because you're trying to do it all yourself. And you're running out of time. Start lists right now of things that you can delegate and things that you can drop. Can't say it simpler than that. Particularly the drop. And then finally, let's do the time chunking exercise for a week and I'll send you a, a template that you can print out to write down what you do every 15 minutes for a week and then go through those questions. Okay, and I have one final request for you as well. I would like you to send me an email if you can now in the next couple of minutes to ben at benhunt.net tell me in as clear and bold terms as you can what you think that this webinar could mean to you or feel free to type it into the questions box now okay and then in a few weeks two or three weeks when you've done these six things contact me again and let me know what it means to you right because the reason why I'm doing this is twofold. You know, I would like to earn more money. I'm gonna I'm gonna sell the recording of this over time, okay? But I'm my goal in life is to make more money by making the world a better place over and over and over again. So please let me know right now um, what this means to you today, and do these six steps. I'll, I'll send you an email to, to summarize what they are. And then, if you will, please contact me again in a couple of weeks to let me know how it's worked. But one thing you shouldn't do, don't just ignore it. Don't just go back to, okay, what's next on my to-do list? Okay, because now you know, and there's no excuse. So thank you very, very much for your time. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. So just type them into the questions box. But uh, otherwise, it's been uh, quite a long session. And thank you for, for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everyone who's uh, saying that. Um, yeah, please do send me your, your, your thoughts. If you can send me a testimonial that I can then use to try and get persuade more people to watch this then I would very much appreciate that because I've uh, put a lot of work and a lot of effort in, into this
Okay, right, I'm going to stop the recording and um, I might see you online for the next one.